guys, welcome to Mad Science Films. I'm Jimmy P, filmmaker and sexual astronaut. First up, guys, please check out our fourth feature film for free over on YouTube. Just search for Little Monster or click on the link in the show notes below. This episode, I'm joined by a very special guest, Mr. Terry Cooper, director of Off World and soon to be the director of his second feature film, Bloody Students. Terry, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hello, and thank you for having me. Did you have much time for rehearsals and read-throughs with the cast? Yeah, yeah. Um, like I say, we, we, we had about a year between the, the coming up with the... Well, once we'd cast people, we had about a year between that and the actual starting of shooting um, because we had some you know preparation to do in building sets and, and working out locations. But uh, we had about a year, and the good thing about Offworld is the cast were really proactive. You know, They were excited about... The crowdfunding which you know would resulted in a decent you know return on the crowdfunding and they really got into the thought of let's just do our best with this so you know we had a couple of meetups we occasionally drove out of wales to meet up in someone's house to rehearse a few scenes and uh it, it's always hard when you get together in person you know it's always hard to focus on what you should be doing because people want to chew the fat and get to know especially if you haven't met before you yeah. just want to talk and get to know each other and you know at some point i've got to be that guy who goes guys 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 can we start doing the scenes now because you've been talking about your, your dog and your cat you know uh for the last hour and we really need to rehearse now but you know once we all got into that myself included we all had a lot of lines to learn and, you know, fair play, they did incredibly well. And the fact that when we got on set, most people knew the story inside and out and had lots of their dialogue already up here. And all they needed was someone to feed them the line to start that entire scene off mm. back and forth. I mean, that saved our bacon more than anything, I think, um, you know, because we were doing so many scenes. I'm like, right, we've done scene thing this morning, scene 15 now. Oh, this is the one where they walk from there to there and this happens. And they're like, yeah, I know what one this is. And then go. And then, you know, because a lot of the crew were going, these guys are like almost not referring to their scripts. They're like, they've just got it. And I'm like, I know so we had a year to pr prepare. And, but you can have a million years to prepare. If, you, if your cast won't do it, they won't do it. Yeah. Um. I'm hoping, my, obviously, I'm hoping, I haven't had any rehearsals yet with, with my new cast. I'm hoping that they step up to the plate at some point. Um, they've had copies of the script, so there's no excuse not to have read it. Um, so get on it. If you're watching this and you haven't read the script yet, get on it. Start learning your character, or at least learn some of the lines. I, I, I don't like to change lines too much because it messes an actor up if they're doing their best to try and get the scenes in their mind. And you go, oh, you know that scene? I've cut it in half now. They're like, ah. Thrown my memory process out, so uh, yeah, we'll 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 be getting into that at some point. Excellent. So I'm guessing with Offworld because it's sci-fi and VFX uh, built in, you were working off storyboards and shot lists, or just storyboards, or, or um, <laughs> with me storyboards. I'm not great at shot lists. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. Again, I, I down to inexperience. I don't think. Uh, I knew what I was doing with planning out shot lists. Um, I mean, I was doing a lot of other things. I was going up early in the morning to build the spaceship set. And then I was on the phone to people and doing social media. So I, I shot lists to me were like, you know, I think I could do without a shot list, but as long as I've got it storyboarded. Yeah. Um, so I did storyboard. Uh, I would say about, 80% of the film to this day, it's not finished, but it is storyboarded. So um, that did speed things up a lot. Cause I just had a couple of, um, oh, I got them here. I'm going to the downstairs, a couple of um, photo albums with all the storyboards in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got, I've got storyboards here for something else. Uh, they're all on post-it notes, but you know, it's just, yeah. Yeah. It's like just pencil sketches. Basically I do them like cartoon styly. Someone's picking up the mail, you know, and, but the off-world ones were, were were not much different to this, mm. um, but it, it gave people an idea of um, the shot, who's in the foreground, who's in the background, and the angle, and that that you know speeded up quite a lot. So I want to storyboard uh, off-world a lot. I was just given three big letter set story pads, uh, storyboard pads, plus a storyboard notebook, a lot smaller, and I haven't drawn a single thing in there yet because I'm too busy doing everything. Um, 
So I want a storyboard. I think what I'll do with this one is there will be shot lists because now I know why they're needed and how to do them. And also um, uh, with storyboarding, I think I'll storyboard the most difficult things um, yeah. because if it's a talking headshot, it's just, you know, over the shoulder, your standard coverage, the cameramen know what they're doing. The actors know what they're doing. But if it's a scene where someone's going to run from A to B, jump over a mummy, decapitate the mummy, you know, wrestle someone else to the ground and then catch a book, you know, that is that will probably need some storyboarding and some some pre-planning, you know. I Always learning every film. I mean, you know, we um, we're gearing up on our on our fifth feature and we fully expect to learn a whole bunch of, of yeah you do I things. don't think I don't think you'd ever stop would you no. um and also the reason one of the reasons you don't stop learning on the next film is because you're never doing exactly the same thing you know you're not doing it's not like you're working on a soap opera where it's East Enders and everyone's oh you're at the bar you're at the in the flat you do it you know it's all the same stuff you know you're gonna have a different idea and yeah. I kind of thought that bloody students would be less involved than off world but it's actually more involved because it's a different type of idea and it involves indoor locations as opposed to outdoor and yeah. they have their pros and cons outdoor we have you know weather you know and and temperatures and logistics of getting from a to b and you know sound you know birds and traffic and all that kind of stuff and the general public but indoors you've got you've got venue higher costs and then you've got acoustics and you've got um the logistics of well how can i tailor this scene to make sure they use that door now because originally i mean in, in my in my first script i put scenes of a balcony where they're looking down onto the main exhibition hall but everywhere we've looked apart from the very first venue which we now can't afford because it was ridiculous it was like 700 pound a day and i'm like Unless our Kickstarter raises yeah. one million dollars, you know, we're not going to be able to use that place with the balcony. So now I have to think of how can they still oversee from a from a from a, a place of safety, how can they oversee what's going on down there or in that other place without being in a balcony? Um so I think I'm gonna be doing things like they're watching CCTV monitors up and they go, Oh, look, right. that's that yeah. room because at least you're a distance from wherever the thing's going on and it 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 fulfills the same end goal which is you know i, we're I guarantee though i guarantee it'll end up being better than what you originally had planned and that, that's the great Probably thing about the budget, and i don't budget. mind i i don't mind if it's the same you know as long as it's not worse you know it's 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 a win in my book you know what i mean yeah, often I mean I I know like on our first feature we we had like a, a scene in a, a petrol station and trying to sort one of those out was an absolute nightmare. Yeah. So the producer just turned to me and said, Look, can we rewrite it? So rewrote it and the scene ended up far and away better than the original scene I'd written. Um good. and it and it is often, you know, those restrictions force you to be more creative. Um, yeah. And just off the top of my head, you know, like the idea of CCTV visually, what you can do and play about with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was excited to see. Uh, yeah. What, what comes of it? If you if you, if, for example, our characters are looking at something happening in real life, like in the same space, like from a balcony down to, you know, a floor, mm. you can't cut away their action. But if mm. it's CCTV, something, mm you know, the, the moniker cut out and it cuts yep. out at the right moment, which adds a bit more tension. So it, yep. like you say, it does have its, its uh, advantages, yep. I guess. Yeah. And, you know, building suspense and everything like that, obviously, you know, if they were looking over, I obviously I haven't read it. I don't know yeah, what, but you see they, all of they it. They could call out, but obviously you can't call out you, over. A yeah. You've got that barrier, haven't you? It's yeah, like, yeah. can't do anything so, about what's going on. So that, yeah, it does that's help, the great, yeah. that's the great thing I love about low budget filmmaking is it does force you to be yeah more creative. I've always said this, you know, that were back in the days when people were all, you know, disparaging George Lucas for his prequels. Um, I always said like that guy needs to be given a monetary cap because when he was doing Star Wars with what like no, was it eight million dollars or something? I know it was the seventies, but you have to think more creatively. You know, he he had to. He didn't have CG. CGI wasn't a thing then, so it was like give give everyone rubber masks in in the cantina, you know. But like, do more stuff with map paintings and and think more out of the box to get what you want done, which is what all low budget filmmakers do. Mm -hmm. You know, 
nowadays it'll be like we don't have a balcony uh, if this was you know if i had a hollywood or even like a you know a uk film industry budget you'd be like oh we'll just build a balcony we'll just get some scaffolding in and you know, six weeks to get some guys to make the entire thing and you're like yeah. that's a lot of money i can make yeah. an entire movie for that yeah <laughs> but but coming up through the whole you know zero budget micro budget low budget and you know going through the things hopefully i'm i'm fairly sure people like james cameron ridley scott you know all the big names still bring a little bit of that indie sensibility i mean look at robert rodriguez a king of doing it in camera and, and cutting corners and guerrilla filmmaking um they bring that with them so there was that story about ridley scott when he had the the landing legs of the spaceship on alien and they wanted the characters in spacesuits to walk past them and they they didn't make the landing legs big enough for scale. So they said, this ain't going to work. And Ridley said, put children in the spacesuits. Yeah. Bring some kids in. Yeah. So that way they're small. And it worked. There's just children walking around in spaces, but it makes the, the landing leg look bigger. And it's like, yeah. that's thinking outside the box, you know, yeah. forced perspective sets that don't need to go so far back. They, they just make it smaller as it goes further away. It's you know, it's, so. it's the, the, the basic role of the director is just problem solving. Um, yeah, and, and, and yeah, are, this there goes... tends to be more problems on a low budget film, so a director's got to work harder. Oh, yeah, exponentially more problems. And you know, the goes back to the Edgar Wright thing. He said that he was on a set, he's very young at the time, and all the crew were a lot older and more experienced than him. And they were like, Who's this, you know, little posh kid who's been given the job of director? Is the is he the son of the director general or something? And he said, I had to be so on my game that. The second I go, I don't know, they've got me. You know, I'm thrown to the wolves. So he said, I was super prepared every time. As soon as I, someone had a question, I'd have an answer for it. And they were like, fair play. He knows his stuff. And he said he got the kudos from the the older crowd, the older crew and cast, you know, because of that. And that's something that I didn't have back on Offworld. You know, we, we got through it, but I felt like I'd stumbled blindly all the way through the film process and went, Oh god, that could have gone better, but it is what it is. You again, you you learn, and your first film will always be that kind of experience, I guess. Yeah. Oh yeah, trial by fire, and and again, I think that goes back to the point we were making earlier about number of um, first time directors who don't who don't make a second film. Oh yeah, I mean, look, I I I'm as fallible and as uh, prone to hissy fits as ever, anyone, and. Not long after filming Offworld, uh, well, the day after we finished, we wrapped. The day after we wrapped, um, we finished on a Saturday night. Um, that that very night, the, I got home. I didn't even have a shower. I was hit with stomach pains because I had like a gallbladder problem. I had like a gallstone. And if anyone's ever had that, basically, it's a, a really dumb ache underneath your rib cage that gets worse and worse. It, it can either stop in about two hours or it can keep going for about nine or 10 hours. And the pain, you can't get to it. Your painkillers won't touch it. It won't touch it at all because it's not in your stomach or anything like that. And and the pain goes round your back and over your shoulder blades. And you're there go, and nothing feels comfortable. You can't sit up, you can't lie down. And I had an attack of that. And that, that had been happening for a while, for like two years. And I was scheduled for surgery on the Monday morning. So I came uh, Sunday night, I got home, racked in agony everyone else is like oh we're tired and but we made a film and i'm like ah, i can't get any sleep because i'm in agony and then monday i'm straight into hospital sunburned hair everywhere you know i was like i made a feature film two days ago and i had an operation and i spent the two weeks rec you need to have two weeks in bed after that because you've got four or five holes where they've cut you open and pulled you out and put catheters in and stuff and i was just not in a good place i was like that film killed me physically emotionally financially everything and i'm lying in a hospital bed you know just in pain and everything else and it's like i i could easily watch and walk away from this film now you know and I, I got into arguments with people i mean to this day there are certain bridges that have been burned um people i won't ever speak to let alone work with again uh, i'm not holding grudges in the case of i'm not going to disparage anyone or or name and shame or anything like that it's just that's an experience i don't want to repeat it didn't work you do your thing i'll do mine um so 
but on the on the plus side i've made a lot of friends and um you know uh friendships have been tested ridiculously uh good and bad um so i think you have to take what you can out of it and try and remain as positive as possible um but like i say uh, I, i'm not for all the um tenacity and for all the uh people saying well fair play you stuck with it at the end so you stuck with it but not not once uh more than once you know i thought i'm chucking this in i'm chucking it i can't do this you know but again people occasionally pull you back and occasionally you you have a few days away from it and you go no damn it i'm gonna do it i am actually gonna do it so it's a case of just hanging on you know some Uh, sometimes you're pushing the car sometimes you're being dragged by the car so I, like I guess that. that's, that's it. good. That's good. So, in terms of uh, off world and in the run up to the the production, how many crew pre production meetings were you able to have, and and did you feel it was enough when you actually got to set? Or we had no way enough. Um, we had about two or three production meetings, um, but almost, I think we only had one with the main crew of the sound guys and the and the um the camera guys because. They were off doing their all, you know, their their day jobs and their their other paying work and stuff. Um, we had a two or three production meetings with some of the the runners and the producers and some of the cast. But ultimately, you meet up in somewhere like Cardiff because it's central and that happens to be a pub and it just turns into a social. And uh, I try I'm trying to avoid that as much as possible. Um, I want people. I'd rather do Zoom because people. Uh, like now, you know, you you're given a time, you know, you've got to be in front of the camera, and you've got to talk about stuff. Um, and I've got a production meeting tomorrow, in fact, uh, with the guys at Candy Jar, my publisher, and that some of them are working on on Kickstarter stuff for me, and you know, they're helping me corral my thoughts as to how to set it all up. Um, but we're meeting in an office. It's not gonna be like oh, we're in a coffee shop or a or a, or a pub. Um, but we're just sitting there, and we've got a more of a kind of a this is this is work. You know, it may not be paying right now, but it, it's it's still a work meeting. Let's let's try and keep that focus. So yeah, uh, we didn't do enough production meetings, I don't think, um, because although we did one or two, without the experience, you're going how many is enough? You know, it's like uh, you we still ended up on set on day one or on location on day one with. A heck of a lot of unsolved problems going well how are we going to do this you know so uh again you live and learn and hopefully it will be better this time around yeah yeah so the main part of the shoot uh was the six days exterior how many yeah. days were you shooting on the uh the set well the 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 spaceship set the interior was in a double garage mm. and we shot what we thought was all the all the scenes we needed before the exterior yeah uh, so, uh, shoot so we did i think two days i mean it took me about four months to build me and a, a handful of other people it took us four months to build it then we got everyone in um i was directing um we had the sound guys the camera guys uh four cast members so we'd done all those scenes then the guy playing the pilot pulled out yeah so we're like we've got to get back in there at some point so we did that we did the the location shoot with me playing the, the pilot guy and then we just we had to go back and luckily the guy whose garage it was because it wasn't my garage it was a guy i knew you know he was saying when is the you know you've had it for four months you know with my blessing and you've used my electricity to run your drills and lights and everything else um but at some point i need this garage back because he he's it's a double garage and he was going to turn it into a mini flat for his daughter when she goes to college so he's like a little me you know decent carpet and everything kind of stuff so uh i was like well i'm glad we didn't strike that set too soon because you know i don't know how we would have done it maybe just green screen me in on top of this guy or something um so we we went back for one day we had one day and the set actually was in not great shape when we by the time we shot it because um most of the interior walls it was all mdf but we coated it with a really thin uh, a really thin layer of EVA foam. Now, this is like what they call funky foam, you know, it's like, it's like soft, yeah. spongy stuff. And we had this stuff that was, it was a metallic gray, a really nice shiny metallic gray, and it looked like metal plate. Mm. So we were just using, we had a, like it's a five, six foot roll of it, and it was a couple of hundred meters long. 
and we were just cutting the shapes out using spray adhesive, spraying it on the MDF and then boop. Yeah. Um, now, it does mark when you put your fingernail on it or whatever, but generally it looked really nice. But because of the weather was so hot, that garage turned into an oven. It was cold in the nights, yeah. hot in the night. And all this um, this foam stuff started like bubbling off and coming away from the MDF. So we were pushing it all down. You could hear it cracking and stuff. And we we're like, oh, thank goodness. It's just about hell holding together for us to do one day of uh, of shooting all these internal uh, flying the spaceship scene so thankfully it held up and then um we we were going to strike the set that week um but uh, adam our producer at the time said why don't we put a call out see if anyone wants to buy it i'm like who's gonna buy you know a a, a giant mdf spaceship interior but we put a call out and we got a call back from a a place in uh the birmingham area called grange live gaming like a gaming um venue and they said we'll do it we'll turn it into a land place we'll put monitors everywhere and everyone can play land simulator games in this spaceship so i was like it's not in the best condition guys and they was like no we'll you know we'll we'll come down and we'll bring a van and we'll rip it to shreds we'll take a load of photos first because a lot of it was bolted to the walls of the garage you know and screwed and all this kind of stuff i was like i don't know how you're going to get this to stand on its own but they did it and it lived there for about two years and then i had another message from them saying they've sold it to another gaming venue down in the West Country. And that was three years later. So that 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 ship's still living, you know. Uh, I don't know how it, what it looks like. If I can ever uh, get the time, I'll, you know, we'll hop around and see if we can see what our spaceship's doing now, you know. Yeah, do it for the 10-year the reunion. I know, imagine that. Oh, man, <laughs> it's not that. And the weird thing is it's not that far off, 10 years. <laughs> yeah. For a sec, when you said it, I was like, yeah, I wonder where we'll be in 10 years. I'm like, Hang on, it's been seven already. So, <laughs> bloody hell. Wow, wow. So, again, it's 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 not typical for a first-time filmmaker to consider building sets, but obviously, you know, there are a lot of spaceships lying around. Was that something that you were pretty confident about tackling? And, and is that something that you've got in the back of your mind for bloody students as well? Um, with Offworld, uh, building a spaceship set was not not daunting in the slightest um, because, you know, I I've worked on miniature props and sets for the stop motion place. And then I did some work in Pinewood and set some props. Um, so I'm, I'm not the best carpenter in the world at all, but I know my way around the tools and I know what looks good. I know how to detail things up. So um, some of the cast were like, it, we, we've done a, an awful behind the scenes making of documentary, which is longer than the movie itself. Weird enough. It's got all this like, footage and the cast were going and like amy rollins was saying so i get this phone call and they say can you come up uh to film in this in the spaceship set i'm like yeah it's going to be what you know just some paper on the wall or a green screen or she goes and i walk into this garage and there's i'm walking onto the bridge of a spaceship with working lights and levers and seat belts and she's like they built a spaceship in a garage and it was just like being on star trek or something and i was like I forget how exciting that is to some people, especially when they've got a physical space to act in rather than sit in this chair with green behind you and pretend you're flying, you know. Um, and it did look really nice. Um, and that didn't worry me. And now with bloody students, uh, the problem with trying to find a venue is it's got to be a venue that looks like it could be a museum. And um, not every hall i mean I, I was going to get a local community center which just got four walls and a roof and a floor and i'm like well we're going to need exhibit stands and we're going to need like certain corridors we even need an elevator like a lift with working doors i thought i have to build all this and it didn't scare me about planning it and designing it but you know i did have people say to me can we find a place that we can dress up a bit better rather than having to build, you know, lots of flats with the with right. yeah. wood and all this kind of stuff. And um, I think I bowed to their um, advice there because it's a case of like, it may be okay, but I don't want it to look too B movie, low budget, whatever. I don't want walls wobbling. Uh, <laughs> Ed Wood, I slammed the door and the wall, the wall moved, but that's what would happen. He's a giant guy, you know. It's like, okay. So, um, there, there will be little bits of set building done, not too much. Um, yeah. But I mean, I downstairs now I'm starting to build plinths, which are about a meter or so tall. And they're just square white boxes, basically about a meter tall. 
and we're going to put um, clear acrylic boxes over the top. So I find anything interesting, you know, like a statue or a vase or something, and I'll put the plastic over the top. And we'll have a number of plinths that we can move around. It's like modular, so you can kind of put yeah. two plinths together and put something long on it. Or you can, when you change your camera angle, you just move the same plinths over there with a different thing on top, and it looked like a populated museum. It's going to be the most uh, permissive, trustworthy museum in the world because they, there isn't going to be that much behind glass. So, I mean, even if you're buying sheet clear plastic, it's not cheap. So... I can't afford to have an entire wall of, you know, eight foot sheets of clear plastic with things behind them, like you'd find in a museum, which would be glass, you know, like cavemen and suits of armor and stuff. They'll just have to be out there and probably with a rope just in front of them and saying, please do not touch. So it's like the most trustworthy museum where they trust everyone. Not the, Don't nick anything. I know this is a Fabergé egg, but we haven't got enough glass around it. So just don't touch. Look what happened to the Mona Lisa, you know. <laughs> So on off world and obviously planning ahead then for bloody students. In terms of, did you have like a VFX consultant on on set while you were filming? Uh, you know, for like the displays and the monitors and everything like that, or did you have enough knowledge that you kind of knew in terms of markers and everything what you had to do? Yeah, well, the the um, I basically had to keep in mind what was uh, what was going to happen with it. We did have some green screen around the spaceship set. You know, so you can comp in or, or at least separate those elements to put the stars flying past and stuff. Yeah. Um, but our our effects people, there was there was uh, Sam Lewis Day who was down in Cardiff. She was a student. Um, she didn't come up to set. Gareth Wood is in Sheffield. Adrian Sace is outside Birmingham. So they couldn't come down to do all this. So I basically made copious notes and I got screenshots and drew on the screenshots and photoshopped stuff together and said, well, this needs to be here. And some of the things, uh, like I say, some of the effects guys would just suggest things to me. So originally I was just going to have black squares in front of everyone. And then when you got like an over the shoulder shot, that would be a black square with some white crosses on it. And we'd comp in, yeah, you know, some graphics. Um, but Gareth Wood said, why don't we just have the holographic ones that float in front of you, just transparent, but you can see all this animated. I was like, can you do that? So I can do that. How much camera movement have you got? I'm like, almost none. It's almost completely locked off. He goes, even better. You know, yeah. and he yeah. he also did things that I didn't even ask for, which was subtle, but they worked. I mean, I'm in the spaceship, whatever. And behind me at the back wall, I put in some of these. Um, where are they? Over there. Over there. Uh, you know, just little LED Christmas lights. You know, we drilled some holes into the wall and popped the LED lights through. So we got just little points of light. But he had them pulsing just by adding them, like making them pulse in After Effects. And he's like, but then when it's pulsing, you can see the roof, which is covered in this 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 shiny foam, whatever. So he's put the the light reflection of the colored lights pulsing as well. And again, if you weren't told that, you wouldn't notice that. You'd think it was a practical effect, but... You know, it was just brilliant. And he did stuff like campfires out on location. We weren't allowed to set fire to anything or dig any holes. Sure. So we'd, we'd have them sitting down doing these long, wordy expository scenes where we'd have a, a circle of rocks and some twigs all like put together like that. And he comped in fire and smoke, which looks perfect. And, you know, when, when you hear the crackling of the, the campfire, it just looks fine. Yeah. <laughs> you forget that they're sitting there going, ooh, bloody freezing. Um, <laughs> But even in the shots where it's like a big close up in in the very corner where we on camera about here, you just see the odd flame go and a little bit of smoke wafting past, which nice. you didn't have to do. And you could get away with as being a close up, mm. but it helps sell it that yeah. much better. And, uh, you know, I can't thank those guys enough because they work without pay for the yeah. most part. Yeah. And they're coming back to on bloody students. Yeah.